don't know about you, but every time I have a topic like this to preach on, I find myself stretched in the very same area that I'm preaching on. This, this often happens for preachers, and people don't always understand that. And um, so this morning, I want to come and I just want us to go on a journey where our friendships can be stronger and deeper and more meaningful, that we can end up in, in a space like the young guy who was just talking about what happened. When I was a young guy myself, I started out as a fitter turner in the railways. A whole bunch of guys I hung out with and we kind of considered ourselves friends with each other. I had one really close friend. Uh, well, he's as close as I would let somebody get, but you know, we were pretty close. We used to go fishing together, we used to do things together. But a peculiar thing happened to me. You see, I was okay and I was a good friend as far as I was concerned because I didn't know any different. But when I became a, a follower of Jesus, some of these guys decided, that's it. And suddenly their friendships went and then it got made worse because a couple of years down the track after I left the railways, I ended up with a situation where I had quite a responsibility in the workplace. And I went to visit my friends because I happened to have some time available to me to do that because I'd had a call out that night and so I thought I'd go and visit my old railway friends. An interesting thing happened. As I went near them, they walked away. My best friend, my best man, turned around and put his back toward me and was digging his head in a toolbox pretending he was doing things with his tools in his toolbox. I said, oh, what's up, bro? He said, you ought to know. And uh, we had a, attempted a wee discussion on this whole thing. And I said, I, I ought to know what? You ought to know. I said, well, I don't know. I wouldn't be asking. What's up? And he said to me, oh, he says, you're a boss. And I said, but I'm, I'm not your boss. Well, you know what happens with bosses. We don't talk to bosses. Because that's what the railways did, you see. If you became a foreman or a sub-foreman, you, you got treated by the men pretty badly. And uh, I think part of it was because the railway had this practice of, of appointing people to be in charge who actually were, were often incompetent. They'd just have been there long enough to get the job. That's the way it used to operate in the railways. So if you've been there 40 years, you'd end up being a foreman. And um, unless you sort of dirtied your nappies on them. And so, so, you know, I, I suddenly discovered people who I thought were my friends weren't my friends at all. And I think a lot of us go through that. And if I don't do this thing up, my friends might laugh at me. All right. And so what actually happens in real friendship is that we, we have a sweetness about it. The book of Proverbs in the Bible says this, the heartfelt counsel of a friend is the sweetest perfume and incense. Now, in, our, in today's world, uh, men don't like to think of it like that, but plenty of guys, you, we're, we are after shaving that, so let's reconvert it for the guys. A heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as aftershave. Underarm deodorant. Makes things smell better. Makes things better. That's what I was actually talking about. But there are some things that really destroy the possibility of friendship or even destroy friendship in itself. And I want to I wanna look at those things this morning because, first of all, just briefly, because the things we often don't realize are actually damning the potential for really healthy, deep friendships. So we get it like this. Friendship destroyers. Here they are. Fear. Second one. Oh, I did something. Distrust. Anger. And you see the passage I forgot to hide earlier. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Actually, it's not just male. It should be person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Why is that? Because it's not a friend. 
They're not a friend. Then the next one, negativity. People who are always being negative, they're not friends. Because if they're being negative, they're going to, if they're being negative to you about other people or negative about things around them, they're going to be negative to others about you and things around you. So just dangerous. Gossip. It's one of the other things that, 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 that talks about. That verse there, Proverbs chapter 6, uh, verses 16 to 19, it says this, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, that means to be prideful. Dishonest tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, in other words, the people who are mean. A heart that devises wicked scheme, schemes, in other words, they're self-centered. Feet that are quick to rush into evil, they're troublemakers. A fa- false witness who pours out lies, somebody who's a gossip or a slander. And a person who stirs up dissension amongst brothers. It's a dis- divisive person, a conflict person. Some people just like conflict. Don't know why, but that's the way it is. So wrong friends bring about wrong outcomes. The text says this, you adulterous people, this is um, um, James writing this letter, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now I've actually seen some people who claim to be Christians, and of course this particular passage was written to some Christians. They claim to be Christians but their love for the world is so strong, and they think, you know, you know, and I've even had some try to convince me, I'm going to be all right, you know. Gary, uh, Gary, it doesn't affect me. I can go and do these things, it doesn't affect me. I can hang out with these people, and it doesn't affect me. You see, the interesting thing is, this little text is right. It says, uh, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It doesn't happen just like that. It's something that slowly but surely and subtly creeps up on us. We become something that we never intended to be. So we have to be careful with that. Then dangerous friendship. In Corinthians, Paul writes writes these words, I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls themselves one close to you. And some people translate it a brother, but the particular word that's used here actually talks about being close in the womb but a sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler, with such, pers- with such a person, do not even eat. I know this is a really hard call. Paul makes this really tough call. Now, he makes it clear in another passage, if a person's not a follower of Jesus, then, it's, it's, you know, you, 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 you can communicate with them, try and reach them. You're not to judge them. Says that. This is actually really talking to people who are claiming to be Christians who've got people in their lives who are claiming the same thinking but do these things. Then the next one. It says very clearly. Oops. I I didn't even touch a button that time, so I don't know what happened. Here we go. A perverse person stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. It's, it's really interesting that we, we need to understand this particular thing because that's actually what happens. That's the mechanism that occurs around people and we need to be watchful of that. Then another one, a, a, a little quote I got from um, Bill Hybels and out of one of his books, out of a book called Simplify, he said, stupid rubs off. I like it. There's a better, a better way of saying it than the way I've been saying it for years. Those who walk with the wise grow wise, he says. So if you walk with the wise, you grow wise. But just like often in the Proverbs, there's always one side of the story told and then the other. And so the second side of the story is told, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Who wants to be stupid enough to suffer harm? Growing wise means you will benefit, and that so will those around you. And so, spend time with the wise is what the message is. 
Then true friendship talks about a righteous person is cautious in friendship. They go, go rushing in like a, 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 a term that we often use in the English world. We're fools. What? We've angels fear to tread. Fools rush in. Thank you. Got it right then. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, we, 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 we don't think about this sometimes. But the other side of this whole thing, it says, but the way of the wicked is what? Leads them astray. See, Pro- Proverbs, once again, does this kind of comparison thing so that we get clarity on the subject. Because if you only had one half, you may not think of the other option. And we often find this in the Proverbs. True friendship, a guy, an early church um, father of the Christian faith, he wrote this, and I thought it was a really helpful saying. There is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship. I think that's true. You see this guy here who's on the screen? His name's Derek Wenmos. Some of you know Derek. Some of you because you're in the education sector and you meet him through that because he's been traveling around New Zealand helping schools and things, and but Derek and I are incredibly close friends. And when we got, when Paulie and I got married, Derek wasn't even married, he was a single guy. I got into a bit of trauma space, consequence of getting married. I didn't cope too well with marriage. Like a lot of guys, you know, we want to be married, we want all the good things that go with that, but we still want to be single and do all the good things we used to do. <laughs> but you can't do that same thing, you can't live that pattern when you get married. And, And it caused huge conflict in our home. And Derek was the guy I could go to as a single man. I could bleed all over him. And he'd be wise with his answers to me. And he'd pray for me. The true strength of our friendship is such that I don't see him sometimes for a number of years. And we meet up together and it's as if we saw each other yesterday. That's the depth of our friendship. Very powerful friendship. A number of years ago when I got attacked and I was in hospital and people didn't think I was going to survive, Derek jumped on a plane and flew here and came to my bedside to pray for me from Christchurch. I didn't even know he'd been. Only later on I found out he'd been. He said, you did talk to me, but my memory was totally gone. Um, But that's a friend. A real friend who will lay themselves out for you. Somebody who will be there for you. And I always know, no matter what I hit, I can give Derek a phone call and he's here as my closer brother. There's others here in the church who we've developed that kind of friendship. And, you know, we've, a lot of us are friends here. But there are some that get really, really close to all of us. The next thing. God wired us to function best when we're in great friendships. He calls it in the Bible community. He calls it the body. He has those sort of descriptions of what we are, what that friendship means, that we are bound together. We are like a body, that we don't move without the other one moving. That's the depth of the friendship. That's the illustration that most Christians, I think, miss out on. They get so concerned with the fact he's talking about the body and the fact it's about spiritual gifts. It's not just about spiritual gifts. It's a description of who we are and how we're meant to function. And we don't all function the same. Hallelujah. Just as well. It would be a terrible church to be in if we all did the same thing. You'd, have, you'd probably have one or two guests sitting in the seats and, and 100, 200 worship leaders. Oh, you'd... Or do you have everybody trying to do, play the, in the band or everybody trying to lead the youth or everybody trying to, you know, I mean, you, you get the picture. We're just not all the same. We are the body. And friendship means that body works best. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about my body is that I got damaged pretty badly quite a few years ago. They called it a soccer accident. I call it intentional damage. As I was running away from this guy with the ball, and he told me later, he just took it off me so easily all the time, I got angry inside. So he kicked my foot out from under me. So as this foot landed in the ground, he kicked this foot that was just leaving the ground. 
My foot stayed dead still because the ground was nice and firm and my sprigs were stuck in there and my body spun right round and I was facing the opposite way and things went bang, snap, crack. I was, I was off my feet for four and a half months. At least the guy had the courage to come and apologise to me in hospital. He wasn't a Christian and he felt pretty bad about it. And I, and I really respected him for having the courage to do that because some people wouldn't have. But, see, you know, we are wired to function in great friendships. In a healthy group, we will more readily accept change and welcome um, self-discovery. We actually don't do that easily on our own. When we isolate ourselves too much, one of the things that happens is that we start seeing people with very jaded eyes. We start seeing things in a way that's not healthy. We start operating in a way that's not healthy. And we don't always uh, know I mean, the number of people over the years I've, I've ended up counselling who have done that. And it's just, it's just awful when that happens. That's what happens when the body doesn't operate as the body, when the body's not fully connected. So I want to talk now, because we've dealt with some bit of negative stuff. I really want to spin into the more positive angle of the whole thing of friendship. So you've, you know all the danger points. You know the warnings. You ignore any one of those, that will mean you won't have healthy friendships. Okay? So let's talk about, first of all, expanding your friendship circle. I sometimes have had the difficulty in church life where people have wanted to be really close friends with somebody else, sometimes with me. And I, none of us can invest for really close friendships in everybody. We can be friends and we can be good friends, we can have a great time together, but there are some friends... And some friendships that need to be deeper for our own well-being and our own health. Some people are too afraid to do that because they say it forms cliques. Jesus got, Jesus got accused of that. Did you know that? <laughs> you know? Some of the guys weren't too happy about the fact that there were some that were really close to him and some that weren't so close. So... How do you expand your friendship circle, so? Because sometimes that's hard as well. well. Friends are family, we choose ourselves. When I say ourselves, I mean that's two way. It's a two way thing, it's not a one way thing. Sometimes people like it happened with my body, my, 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 my left foot actually was in such a terrible mess. My rest of my body would have preferred to be without it, quite frankly. It was in pain for years and years and years. They didn't do a very good job of putting it back together. They got the muscles under my foot that had ripped in two pieces, and they overlapped them and stitched them together like this. So the nerve ends here and the nerve ends here were raw. And so every time I put my foot down, pain. For years and years and years until I actually had an actual miraculous healing when we were in Hamner one year. Hang out with God-honoring people and you'll end up with great friendships. I'm serious. Hang out with God-honoring people and you'll end up with great friendships. Next one. Friendships means you will choose to change. You will choose to change from your heritage default settings. So if you're a person who has, you know, and everyone has got heritage default settings that are not good, you know, some people are just way too overloving. Why they're too overloving? Because they lacked love in their own lives, and so they don't feel secure. And so one of the reasons why so many people get themselves in difficulty in relationships and end up with children when they didn't need to have them is because there's a default setting that's there. And it can be caused by all sorts of things. Now, all of us mess up. So some of us have anger issues like I had when we got married. I had real anger issues, very serious anger issues. And uh, man, I used to want to, I wanted to thump people sometimes. I did, including some Christians. I, I would get, my, my instant reaction before I became a Christian would be that my fist would fly before my mind thought. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I got myself in awful trouble. I remember hitting one young fella who 
who, who uh, provoked me down by the boat sheds in, in Christchurch. And he purposely provoked me, I realized later. And I said, do that again and I'll, I'll biff you one. So he did. He shoved his push bike wheel between my legs. and had a little aerial in those days off the, off the axle. And I was, remember those ones for those of you old enough? And it hurt me. Well, I didn't need to be hurt. And so the next thing, it was an all-on fight. My mate, who used to see on television doing barefoot water skiing, won't name him, my mate ran away. Now, looking back, he was the wise one, but I was really mad with him afterwards. I said, why didn't you stay? I mean, you could have helped me. He said, didn't you know who that fellow was? And I said, I have no idea. Well, he's the junior boxing champion in New Zealand. <laughs> I survived, but man, I must have been really lucky. <laughs> you, know, you see, sometimes we take on things because of our heritage settings that are way beyond our capability. That's really dumb. And sometimes it's other things, like it's attitude stuff. You know, we, we can get real attitude about somebody succeeding and us not succeeding because it was inbuilt in our family. As long as we're obsessed with those things, it actually depowers us and robs us of two things. One, it robs us of, of friendship and second, real friendship. And the second one, it robs us of being successful for a number of reasons. And we can pa- unpackage that another time. Healthy friendships like this, these two, two little cute kids, I couldn't resist them. Friends are those rare people who ask how we are and then wait to hear our answer. We've all done it. How are you? And before the person gets a chance to answer, oh man, you know, it's been a terrible week for me. (laughs) They don't want to hear that. They want to tell you how they felt first. You ask them. I think we all do it at times. It's kind of dumb things. We we have our own ways. And this partly does the default setting. But we need to listen, wait and listen, discipline ourselves to do that. Friendship. There is no selectivity in friendship. No selectivity at all. Some people look at people and say, oh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be friends with that person. They always smell. Or they always, you know, they're always clearing their throat. Or, or they don't look good. And if I'm with them, I won't look good. And one of the incredible things that, that happens to us in life is sometimes the people who seem most unlikely can be our best friend. When I first, uh, um, when Dad first built a milk, bought a milk round, there was a guy on our milk round. His name was Donald. Donald, um, his mother and father had had three children, and because of the war, they had they didn't know that they actually were brother and sister who had been separated during the war when they were little babies, and because of the loss of records and all sorts of things. And so, what happened? Out of three children, they have two of them had difficulties, intellectual difficulties. Handicaps, difficulties. And Donald was one of those people. I tell you what, though, when things got really rough, Donald was the guy who stood beside me and told the rest of the guys to get off or he'd bash them. Now, I don't approve of that method, but in that, in that sense, he was being a true friend in his way. I always felt safe around Donald from that day onwards. Because Donald, the reason I felt safe is because the phys ed teacher, the PE teacher, we, his name was Mr. Hare, you know, rat, like rabbit type Hare. We used to always think it was funny that he was a PE teacher and called Mr. Hare. And he tried to make Donald do the long jump, but because Donald had this in- incapability, he couldn't do the long jump, and so he was scared of it. And so the teacher tried to tell him, you will do the long jump or you get six of the best. In those days, they were allowed to do that to us, and they did. And uh, Donald said, no. And he walked away, and there was a young tree in the ground just nearby. He walked back beside it, and he put his hand on it. And that tree had been in the ground for several years, probably about three years, maybe. It might have been long, I don't know. And the teacher advanced on him, right, you're coming with me. You're, getting, you're going to get the cane. And Donald says, no. And he goes like this, and the tree comes out of the ground. All of us stood there going, Whoa! <laughs> So you know what happened at, at, at lunchtime, when, when lunchtime came up? We hid behind the fence. The fence in the school had a fence and they had some trees in there. The whole group was trying to pull one tree out of it together. <laughs> Donald did it on his own and we couldn't do it with a group. 
Oh, oh, dumb things. See, no, no selectivity. A friend loves at all times. You can't choose when you love if you're a friend. You consistently love at all times. You never give up on that loving the other person. Even if they become a bit difficult. Or even if they're going through some kind of messy stuff. Or even, even if you're going through some messy stuff. And even if things happen, you know, a friend loves at all times. And will keep loving. And not stop loving. And when you're loving, it means you, you're always there. The next one. In terms of forging friendships, there are some things you can do. You be there for them, like my friend Derek. The next one, you be natural. Here's a hint for those of you who find really hard. And there are some people in every group of people that find hard to get friendships. One of the things, the worst things you can do is try to be a friend. The best thing you can do is just be natural. And friendships will flow out of that. But if you're trying to, to you, you want to desperately be a friend with this person, it's probably never going to happen unless you learn to be natural, unless you learn to relax, unless you learn to be the way that God wired you up to be. If you're trying to be something for that person, it's going to fail because that's not who you are. The next one. Give space. You don't need to be in people's face faces every minute of the day. Can I suggest something? This thing here is an incredible friend, but it also can be an incredible enemy. A number of parents over the last few years, not just this church, other ones I've talked with, who complain about the fact that kids are doing this all night and then they're angry kids during the day, that's enemy stuff. Oh, but I've got to keep contact with my friends. Actually, they're not friends if you're at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning needing to text each other. That's not friendship, that's stupidity. Name it for what it is. It really is. Stephen will tell you, the kids at school who've been texting all night are useless during the day because they're trying to sleep during the day. You don't go to school to sleep, you go to bed to sleep. All right? Next one. Give grace. Sometimes people will need grace beyond what you might think they need. They, they, they might need grace because you've misunderstood them. They might need grace because they're going through an awful time themselves. And you may not even know about that. They may need grace for all sorts of reasons. The next one. Real friends don't need to know everything. They don't need to know everything. If they need to know everything, they're controlling people, not real friends. Developing healthy friendships. Don't be selfish. Friendship comes out of being generous to each other. Second one, choose carefully. We already talked about that in the earlier first section, but there's a positive side. There's great people around that you can be friends with and have a great life as an outcome. Confront wisely when there's issues. Be wise about your confronting. You know, do, do, do it well. Do it nicely. Be generous in your spirit. Whatever it needs. Next one. Be faithful. Don't let them down. Don't talk about them negatively. Be there for them. Celebrate without jealousy. If they get given a million dollars because their uncle bequests it to them, don't say, oh, I wish I had that million dollars because that's actually, there's a jealousy spirit behind that statement. You may not recognize it as such, but that's what it is. You ought to say, I'm so glad that you got so blessed by God. Far better thing to say. Actually, Actually, if you, if you come with the jealousy thing, they're going to go, oh, oh, got to protect my pockets with this one. <laughs> All right? <laughs> okay. Ah, see. Healthy friendships should be, are not di dictated by my opinions. 
Healthy friendships should not be dictated by my opinions. They should be dictated by more than that. Because my opinions will sometimes be right and sometimes be wrong. Healthy friendships. Keep forward momentum in your friendship. Make sure you invest in it. Because healthy friendships need healthy investment. It releases those that don't want the best. Healthy friendship does that. So if there's people who don't want the best, who want to keep going down a wrong track, like Paul said, don't even eat with them. Because that's actually not good for you to do. Because in the end, you'll be influenced by them. They aren't judgmental, though. Healthy friendships are not judgmental. They're not going to keep on and on and on at you, being judgmental. It's just not on. There's a, there's a right in the Scripture to make true judgment, but there's not a right to harass a person. Choose grace. The second time I've mentioned this, but that's what we need to do. So I want to turn Bill Hybel's statement around the other way. Empowering rubs off. Positive actions and attitudes. And, and, and Galatians 5.22, I think, is a really good passage for us to get the idea of how we should be. See, if we have a fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, gentleness and self-control, we're going we're gonna to bless others. Because that type of attitude isn't just about us, it's about what it does for others. When I love another person, or I take joy to them, I don't, some of you probably watched some of the Commonwealth Games. I was impressed with one young lady, the pole vaulter. I can't think of her name. I'm not sure what status in life she has, or what, what she believes, or whatever. But there's one thing about her that stood out, and the commentators made this comment. She's always smiling and always happy. Even when she's under the hugest of pressure, there's an incredible grin on her face. She ran up and she hit that pole vault and she shot over the top. And when she hit the bar and it went down, she came up gleaming with a smile. Now, I'm, I mean, if you can do that in life, if you can carry this kind of sense of joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and goodness and gentleness and you can be self-controlled, it's gonna, there's nothing going to stop you having great friendships if these are things you work on and do well in because it'll be an automatic default that people will be attracted because people are attracted to this. Aspects of a healthy friendship. Let's look at it from this angle. Sharing, support, accountability, encouragement, and last of all, personal development. All those things there, the sharing, the support, the accountability, the encouragement, the personal development, they're all part of being a friend. <coughs> See, I can't be a friend if I'm not prepared to support somebody. I can't be a friend with a person unless I'm prepared to share my heart. I can't be a friend unless I'm willing to be accountable. I can't be a friend unless um, I'm willing to keep giving encouragement all the time. You know, one of the things that built into our human nature is when somebody falls, everybody wants to cry out, yay, I knew that would happen. Can I ask you to do something? Before you ever do that to anybody, ask yourself this question. If that was me in their shoes, would I want somebody to be saying that about me? Absolutely no, no way. Absolutely no way. We should never rejoice at somebody else's downfall or somebody else's loss. Jesus modeled healthy, sustainable relationships. And this is really interesting. Most people would start with saying, well, he had 72 good friends. Well, actually, in fact, we know that he had a lot more than that. Some of them turned out to be friends that betrayed him. There were hundreds. And on one occasion, some of his disciples who were relatively close friends of Jesus, 120 of them walked away on one occasion. Still a whole lot more. See, when people read the Bible, and unfortunately the way it's been portrayed by a lot of people, it gives us the impression that Jesus just had this little closed group and that was it. A lot of people get, get that impression from what they hear about the Bible, but it's not like that. Jesus was much, much bigger in his spirit, much, much bigger in his generosity than that. It's the hundreds. Then he had the 72 that he sent out. Then it got narrowed down to a group of 12 that we know about, and one of them wasn't his best friend. 
from Jesus' side, he was. But from, that, from, from Judas' side, he wasn't Jesus' best friend. He let him down. He thought he could arrange things. And some commentators think that Judas thought that if he pushed Jesus, then he'd become the king and he'd rule. That's, some people think it that way. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not really convinced that's what actually happened. Jesus might have just been a rat back. But he's one of Jesus' 12, but he still treated him with love and respect and trust. Right up to the last minute, even when he knew what was going to happen. And then the three, the three that he's really close to. Just three. Just three. So when we look at this whole deal, I want to finish with this last slide. I want to talk about deepening your inner circle. Because sometimes we get friendships and they get to this point. But how do we go further than that? How do we get it to go way, way deeper? Well, there are some things I think that we can do. Be there for them. I talked about that before. But I want to spell it out. Invest time in your friendship. If you live far away, do give them a phone call. We have friends, we were talking with some friends in England last night. You know, we keep contact. Give them a call. And for those who are a bit stingy on the money, if you're short of it, it's totally understandable, but if you're not short of it, invest in that friendship. Don't go too fast with the friendship. You need to go at the pace of the other person, how they feel, why how comfortable they feel. Next, be wisely real. Don't tell everything. My goodness me, I really don't want to know some of the stuff that people want to tell me sometimes. I really don't want to know. I don't need to know. I, for some reason, now and again I've had people say to me things like, oh, Gary, I thought you ought to know this. And they tell me, and I sit there thinking, how do I respond to that? Did I really need to know? I could say that to them. But out of consideration, because I want to be their friend, I say, can I pray for you? <laughs> and I'll do that for them. But really, sometimes we don't need to t share some stuff because sometimes when we share some information about ourselves, we can actually damage ourselves and therefore damage the friendship. So you have to be a little bit discreet, a little bit wise in what you share. Be cooperative and supportive. I had a friend I used to go fishing with quite a bit, and um, he was not very cooperative sometimes. I'd say, oh, let's do this. No, we have to do it this way. So me being me in those days, I'd just go along with it. It's not the best thing. It really didn't help our friendship get depth. So be cooperative and supportive. Be there in the good times and in crisis. One of the sayings I found that uh, a guy called Dale Carnegie, some of you will know who he is, he's written some books. You can make more friends in two minutes by being interested in, in them than you can in two weeks by trying to get them interested in you. I think it's a helpful statement. If you show real interest in the other person, guess what? They know you are genuine then. They know there's no agendas. They know you're not just purely there for your gain. You're there because you love them, because you appreciate them, and because they're meaningful to you. I've got a number of people here in this congregation who I will go and talk with at different times. I don't always go to the same people. Because I know some of you have got strengths in some areas and some in others. That's what our friendship should be like. Share the things that are important with the right people. And it'll help us. So be there in the good times and the bad times. I really want this one thing to happen for every person in this building and for your family and friends. That the meaningfulness of your friendships will become so great and so powerful that others will know that it's really worth knowing you. It's really worth being close to you. It's really worth understanding what you believe and what you hold to if you're a follower of Christ. And if you're not, I want to say heads up to you for being here. It takes courage. And I want to bless you. Because I want the same thing for you. I want you to have the best. For every single one of us in this building. Amen? Let's pray. I'm going to ask God.
to help us. Father God, we know you have been our friend. You have invited us to be your friend. We've sung a song in this congregation many times, I am a friend of God. Lord, sometimes I think we're a little presumptuous and even thinking that we are, unless we're doing things that make real friendship, makes real truth, makes real love. And Lord, so... We'd ask you to help us and guide us, each one of us, whatever stage of journey we're on, so that we might uh, become such a shining light for you. This, this, this church has been talked about in, in words of prophecy and knowledge about becoming a beacon, a light. And so, Lord, we, we want to do that. We want to be what you want us to be. We want to be your friend. We want to be friends that are genuine and real and powerful and create significance in this community, so much significance that we'll even be able to influence um, people who, who are far away from you at this point, that we might have an impact not only on our neighbours, but on people who are trying to help our country by leading our country, people we work with, the companies we work for, and the, our bosses and those who work under us. Help us to get a perspective that really is your perspective and to be friends that are going to be absolutely the best that you could ever make of us. So we ask in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. may the Lord bless you. Hey, let's show appreciation to our team, our tech team and our stage people and the drama. Wasn't that excellent? God bless you. Five o'clock, we've got a baptism service. I've got the hot water running. It blew apart during the week.